Cal Malone. <laughs> it's nice to see I get your name right, right? That's correct, yeah. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Tucker. It's good to meet you, too. Um, I've enjoyed so much your series on Liberty.me on, on anarchism, and I thought it would be a, kind of a good chance for us to, to visit and see if people can get to know you. You're running this um, uh, class on, on Wednesdays, uh, right? Uh, third Wednesday of the month, is that right? Of course, yeah. Uh, every month, uh, and, and as a way to kind of connect with uh, people out there who are not locally located here in Richmond, Virginia, where I'm from. Um, I would say I do most of my activism in terms of uh, spreading anarchy here in the city. Um, so at least it gives a good opportunity to kind of present forth uh, what I'm doing here towards those who are not connected and uh, can't reach out otherwise. What does it mean to be an anarchist activist? Are you throwing, throwing the Molotov cocktails? At, at, yeah, right. at... <laughs> no, those are commies. Those are uh, status oh. denial. Um, well, I, actually, it's a good, good thing that you point that part out because I would say, like in the beginning, um, many years ago, a lot of the when people think of anarchy in terms of a lot of these cities, they think uh, Molotov cocktails, they think uh, smashing uh, windows, uh, anti-capitalist stance, and that was mostly the kind of anarchy I've ever seen um, going around the info shops, going around uh, the groups around in these cities, and I would say part of the things that we do here is uh, marketing and turning that around. And I would say we've been uh, successful in that regards now in the past uh, two, three years now, and uh, having a good measure of success. Of now we have a lot of local uh, brick and mortar businesses who are supporting anarcho capitalism. Uh, they invite us to host our anarcho capitalist uh, parties at their at their at their places. Uh, there's a nightclub who is uh, very much on board. Wants to get into Bitcoin now. Uh, a Thai's corner place that serves Thai food and uh, very much into anarcho capitalism now as well. Uh, so I would say we've, we've won our unofficial war with the local commies here, with the local uh, Malta throwing uh, status in denial. Uh, and I think that's uh, part of the, I guess, putting the capitalism part with the anarchy part, right? Uh, you know, those two have to kind of go together. Why do you say that they, they have to go together? Sometimes I wonder about that, like adding capitalism. Does that not imply that you have a a plan for the world, like you know how it's supposed to work, and, and doesn't that contradict the whole ethos of, of anarchism? Well, I would say that uh, that the day that the end, the state is abolished, I no longer call myself an anarchist, uh, right? So until that point, uh, and not so much, you know, when uh, slavery was abolished, right? I mean, there's still tax slavery, you know, the term abolitionist was no longer used. Uh, so I look forward towards that ends and means, but until now I use the word as to denote more of respect for private property and uh, to look at this more as a, as you would as a salesperson for anarcho-capitalism, as you would as an ambassador, as you would uh, selling any product or message, and I think we have to do this very smartly and cleverly and very, uh, in terms as you market any product, and the product that we're putting forth is freedom. <laughs> and uh, I think it's very, it behooves us then to look at this uh, as you would at any capitalistic venture and uh, putting that forth and out there. Well, that's the capitalist part. What about the anarchist part? Why do you think it's important that people imagine a world without the, the state as versus just cutting back the state, for example? Uh, well, yeah, cutting back the state. I don't look at uh, compromising uh, ethics, compromising uh, virtues. Uh, what do they say? Don't negotiate with terrorism. Well, when you look at the past uh, like 200 years of attempts in trying to achieve freedom through voting, through reforms, through politics, and the fact that you and I, uh, and those listening to the show have been were born as tax slaves implies that all those efforts have failed. And so, looking at that, I don't mean to continue to try to attempt to reel back the state. Um, I think alternatively, there's something that we can do, and towards uh, creating our own community outside of the state and go in that direction. Socially ostracize politics and voting and government, and go towards one that's more virtuous and in line with our values. Do you ever have a problem in, in defining the state? Like some people think that if you have a, for example, a, 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 an agreement among homeowners in a subdivision, uh, and there's there's dues that you pay with your mortgage to that, that that's that's very state-like. But where do you where do you draw the line? Do you think there's a strict distinction between the state and non-state um, institutions? Well, as it stands right now, the state uh, infects everything. Uh, you know, you, you can't. It's it's in our language, it's in our words, it's in uh, when you go outside, uh, and a lot of the things that you do in terms of commerce, uh, it's all over the place. Um, so there's nothing I would say that's kind of untouched by the state and trying to corrupt it. 
uh, especially uh, our language and words. Um, you know, the, the millennials, are, there's a good reason before they came out they can't differentiate between capitalism and socialism going back and forth. Uh, so I would say that I always use golf course communities. I know there's a home association community. I use that always as an example. You know, when you end the monopoly of a community, like here in the uh, tax form of Virginia, as a monopolized community, um, you end this day, you have thousands of competing communities catering to your lifestyle and preferences. So you could have your homeowners association community with those brochures, with those contractual uh, agreements, consensual agreements, uh, versus the non-contractual, you know, uh, relationship you have with the uh, government and the forced community that they imposed upon you. Um, so I would say that, uh, then yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, homeowners associations, they're kind of examples of that. I use, like, uh, in Florida, they're very specific in their preferences in terms of uh, people who are much older, like 55 and older communities. You know, they have 65 and older communities. They're very, they have their preference in those particular areas, and that's what the uh, contract agrees to, and I think that's pretty cool. That's awesome. Um, and you've got the whole digital world, too, out there. One of, one of the striking things, one of the things I don't really understand is, is how it is that we could live in a digital age where there's basically anarchism uh, in, in cyberspace everywhere, its own set of laws, uh, its own set of associations and order, and yet you see uh, ongoing innovation, prosperity taking place, and yet the lesson seems to be largely lost on people. The biggest experiment in anarchism in the history of the world has been insanely successful, and yet uh, people still don't, don't recognize it. Actually, yeah, that's that is a good point. Uh, I guess you could start off with the first uh, uh, AOL group chat rooms or the first Yahoo chat rooms. Uh, no one's forcing you to go in any particular chat room. Those are voluntary. You can't uh, force someone to go into, uh, you know, uh, the alternative uh, chat room versus one if you want to talk about video games. Um, they're very much in control of those choices. Uh, yeah, that that is a good reflection of anarchy uh, in, in regards to how you associate yourself with others and who you don't want to associate yourself with. Um, I think that's very important. Uh, like, for example, people talk about cannabis. We're talking about um, about belittling the government or bringing it back down some. And for me, I don't, uh, I don't advocate for, I guess, legalization or uh, criminalization or any of that stuff. 75 years to finally have the freedom to smoke a plant, for me, it's not a measure of success, right? Mm -hmm. um, one step one step forward to have the freedom that should have been yours by birth to begin with, but to have lost so many of us in the same amount of time, it's a sleight of hand distraction. It's your bread and circuses. It uh, deceives and tricks people and misleads them to believing that politics could possibly set you free. Um, and that's uh, the opposite direction where I want to go. Let me ask you about your own ideological heritage and, and background. Uh, people usually come from the left or they come from the right or somewhere. Uh, what, what about your own intellectual journey? How did that take place? Uh, I would say the uh, the first government I fought was uh, my father. Uh, I would say uh, that would be my uh, father's say cartoon. Thanks for being the first government I abolished there. Um, I would say kind of grew up with a lot of uh, anti-authoritative uh, dislike and distrust of uh, people just because they're older than you growing up. Um, so I, I would say it comes from, from that for myself. Um, very distrustful of people, very distrustful of uh, their intentions. Um, and just uh, sitting my way forth in, in that direction. Um, I would say maybe the only validating book that was, uh, I guess, expressively uh, delightful to finally come across would have been uh, The Fountainhead when I was uh, 18. Um, I really enjoyed that, uh, carving out your own road, your own path uncompromisingly. Uh, with your integrity intact. Uh, that was uh, refreshing to see. Um, and I would say I was an objectivist until I met other objectivists. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I took much pleasure, I guess, at the time thinking I was the only one until uh, I got on Facebook and I was like, well, I don't know if I really want to associate myself sometimes with some of them now. But... I think you say that about anarcho-capitalists, too. Yeah. <laughs> That's very true. That's very true. Now that I uh, have a good idea how uh, a lot of them... Um, React uh, online. Um, it's like mm, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Uh, so that's that is that is difficult. I, I guess um, trying to be righteous, trying 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 to do the right thing. Um, comic books, I guess, helps lead to that. Always trying to fight the villains. Always trying to do the right thing. Um, 
Well, what is the what is the book that that you like to to recommend as 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 what? I mean, as far as I'm concerned, there's no perfect book, and there never will be, right? Uh, absolutely, I agree. But but if you had to if you had to just name one reading that you think would really steep everybody in this worldview, uh, which one would it be for you? Yeah, uh, I'll be honest. Uh, I've I've gotten a lot of my friends to read uh, the Fountainhead. Um, yeah, you know, minus his uh, IP terrorism attacks. Um, <laughs> I was about to say, I mean, <laughs> really, really. <laughs> minus, well, I think from that, uh, minus Ayn Rand's, uh, I mean, you can be selfish in helping others, right? And so I look as uh, helping my community selfishly, them being in a better place off uh, will at some point redirect and help me off. Um, you know, the better my community, the better my environment and my surrounding. Uh, the better that they reach towards uh, independence um, and getting off being dependent on the matrix, being dependent on the state, uh, the better off we all will be um, when those kind of in interactions uh, start to connect. Um, so I believe you can be selfish in that regards as well. Uh, it doesn't have to be just uh, self-interest. Your self-interest could also um, include others in helping them as well, could help you as well. Um. Now, to an issue uh, concerning this issue of power and the state, obviously the state is the most entrenched and imperialist and destructive form of power. Uh, does your anarchism extend to suspicion of, of other forms of, of social power, for lack of a better term, or all kinds of uh, authority? And then do you think that, that the thing you're, you're battling is the state, or is it a more general problem of, of power? I, I, I suspect I know your answer. Uh, the state. I think anything else is a distraction. Uh, I think a lot of people have uh, who look at corporations as the enemy. For example, you're chasing after Dr. Frankenstein's monsters. Dr. Frankenstein himself, I want to shut down and abolish. Um, and then the government has done a really good job in using them as their scapegoats for a lot of the problems that they themselves create. Right. Um, so yeah, uh, you end the state, everything else uh, will come out peacefully. As there has been many historical examples to show when uh, like the, the Wild West was not so wild. Um, and the contractual uh, parties that they put together before they set out west to um, cattle ranching and mining operations. Um, so uh, I think it's uh, the misbelief that you could do it through a state. I think that's a potential problem. And that's something that most people though haven't really objectively defined for themselves. Um, and not so much they haven't really taken a moment to define a lot of the words that they use as well. And so even though the state is, is ultimately the, the enemy, um, I think it's mostly, I guess in, in terms of uh, some of the stuff that they bring back towards you to kind of distract you in terms of different centralization of powers, different kinds of uh, corrupting powers out there, um, sometimes the statistics that they put forth kind of splits splinters everyone off. Like they'll say, well, this group of people are more freedom orientated. Uh, these ones are not. Um, and the ones that I always find troubling are the ones where they say, well, males are a lot more freedom orientated because they advocate more for legalization of uh, cannabis, whereas females are not because they advocate for continuing to be criminalized. But of course, none of these people that they selected in this sample has ever been presented the third option of the argument against the state. Uh, so I can't really say it's completely um, unbiased in that regards. Right. Well, the state is, is is divisive in that way. They, they it loves to turn people against each other, and and slice and dice the population. And I appreciate your conviction here, which is essentially that society works with without a state. There's still be problems left in the world, but you can at least have a, a mechanism in place to work them out. And right. I, I want problems. I want problems. <laughs> I don't want utopia. Yeah. Uh, when people say so, you advocate for utopia. Not at all. I want there to be problems, but I want there to be I want there to be ways that we can still upgrade new versions, updates, uh, ways to find a plurality of non-violent solutions that everybody apply and they head in that direction, right? Um, problems are good. That just means that there's another way to to, to make it better to improve upon it. Um, you know, I'm not satisfied with everything here in the present. Uh, I like to to see what the future is like, but the state does a very good job in keeping us all in the past. Uh, especially architecturally. Um, they have a lot of their commission boards that says, well, you can't change the panel of your house, you can't change the window, we have to live in the past. We have to be very sentimental about our statism. As what you're saying is true across the board in terms of the past. I mean, the, the state always rules the past. You know, it's, it's never really thinking about, about the future. It's always freezing things in, in, in place. Architecture is a great example, but, you know, I'm staying right now in a hotel that, uh, uh, has, has, has a dreadful sink and, and shower, for example. 
totally, you know, just because of the state. I mean, there's no reason for this. So they, they, they've rationed the water. Right. Yeah. Unnecessarily so, yeah. And, and those costs could have better been spent elsewhere. Uh, other improvements, a lot of uh, regulations and overhead costs uh, that make it difficult sometimes to do the things you want to do. Um, um, now, during your seminars, you, you, do you enjoy taking questions and, and debating people? Is that, is that part of what you, you like? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say that's uh, the meat and bones of uh, what I do a lot here in Richmond. Uh, the series I do here in Richmond is called Spreading Anarchy. And so I do a lot of debating with uh, on the street with, with a lot of, uh, I'll say by now, probably 500 individuals, uh, probably 250 of those uh, interviews are debating recorded uh, on YouTube. Uh, and I would say that uh, that kind of stuff, I, I feel kind of behoove us all to kind of understand and learn and wield, I think, our strongest weapon against the state are our arguments and uh, to wield them proficiently um, against the fallacies of the left and right wing politics. When you do this, do you wear do you wear a shirt uh, that that causes people to come up to you and say, "Look, uh, that's a crazy idea." <laughs> no. Uh, no, no, yeah, you could. I have had some friends who say that. I have a I have a table and I have my my literature, the pamphlets of anarchy, agorism, all this stuff, and I have a sign that says, "Ask me how government is immoral." Uh, so I invite the question. I invite the the challenge. So I invite the the debates. Um, I'm not in your face. I'm not coming at you. You came to me, and most people who do uh, do so then out of curiosity or out of humor. Best place to have a good discussion. Um, you know, they're already kind of open. Defense is kind of lowered. Uh, not sure what they're getting involved into. Uh, and then I find that to be the best way to introduce the argument against the state. And uh, I haven't. I would say a good a majority, over 95%, agree at the end of the conversation, yeah, that, that makes total sense. Uh, they can't find any logical way outside of that argument. Uh, I of a, a thing that happened to a, a socialist activist who was carrying a sign that said something like, ask me about socialism, and of course, you know, uh, couldn't resist that. Um, and got into a, a quick debate with him about it. But I remember at the time thinking, why, why, why aren't there people on our side who do this? And now I find out that there are. So congratulations to you. That's really Thank exciting. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's uh, uh, the first time I went out that I thought I would have a lot of people say, no, you know, get the hell out of here, you know, try to curse me out. But uh, that's not what ended up happening. And, uh, and over time, I've made a lot of friends to that. Um, over time, we have uh, now we have 75 ANCAPs here, legit ANCAPs. Uh, none of the... Uh, you know, minarchism, uh, back and forth sort of stuff. Uh, we have uh, local businesses supporting us. We have, uh, I find, so I find that as a measure of success to kind of reach out within our own community. And most people think, well, change is going to happen through politics in the White House in D.C. in places you've never been to. And no, it starts, you know, within yourself, within your own interpersonal relationships. And then when you're ready, uh, the neighbors that live around you in your own community uh, and go out there and start inviting the question and inviting the, the discussion. Um, yeah. I, I think... Uh, I'm sure you're aware of uh, the, the the great intellectual uh, Murray Rothbard, uh, but he would have been thrilled to. Have, uh, he was a friend of mine, and I just know he would have been thrilled to have met you and would have cheered you on. <laughs> that uh, means a lot. Uh, I think I saw your uh, your play once. Uh, I think at his birthday party, uh, <laughs> during an Anne Rand sketch, actually. <laughs> I was playing with Andrew Brandon, who recently <laughs> passed away. He's a, he's a great man. I, I played him in his, in his old in his old incarnation as an intolerant enforcer, but uh, he changed yeah. over the years. So. Well, uh, yeah, Cal, it's Cal, it's a pleasure to meet you. And, and you and our this seminar that you do, it's open to the public, so anybody can come. Um, you can watch the schedule on, on liberty.me and and register and and show up and and have have fun debating anarchism. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Jeff Tucker. Well, it's, it's my pleasure to be here with you, and I look forward to, to seeing you very soon again. <laughs> absolutely. You take good care. Okay, all the best. Mm -hmm.